Welcome, dear friends, to Little Rock West Assembly of God's Midweek Refuel Service. On behalf of myself and my wife Mary and our entire church family, we welcome you and we're so glad you've tuned in. This week is Passion Week and this is a week of time that we reflect upon uh, the few days leading up to the Lord's crucifixion and His resurrection. And uh, this program is going to be very special because in just a few minutes, we're going to be taking communion together. And so we want you to uh, go get you some juice and some bread and get ready and prepare because uh, Sister Mary and I is going to go and, and we're going to lead you in some worship. Then after that, I'll be coming back and sharing some scriptures with you. And then we'll be taking communion together. So I'm, I'm really excited about this time we have together. Um, I'd encourage you maybe to call a, a friend or a fellow church member and uh, invite them to join you and we'll just have uh, have this together one big happy family so we'll be back in a few minutes to share communion with you and to share from the word of god uh, some powerful things that i believe will encourage you and will cause us to uh, reflect back upon the goodness of god think about this in john 3 16 for god so loved the world that's you and that's me that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever would believe in him would not perish, but have everlasting life. So call a friend, let's worship the Lord for a few minutes, and we'll be right back. i 
In Matthew's Gospel, chapter 26, it is recorded where Jesus met with his disciples for the last time before he was to be betrayed and before the crucifixion. The purpose for this particular meeting it was very special because he was going to reveal to his disciples what was about to happen. And though they would not fully understand it at this time, later they would, especially after they was filled with the Holy Spirit. Uh, but this was very special, I believe, to the Lord. And uh, so let's read a little bit of it. In, in Matthew 26, beginning to verse 26, And as they were eating, Jesus took bread and he blessed it. He broke it and he gave it to his disciples and he said, Take, eat, this is my body. Then he took the cup and he gave thanks and he gave it to them and he said, Drink all of it, for this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. After that, in verse number 30 of that passage, when they had sung a hymn, after they had had the meal together, they went out into the Mount of Olives, and then those events transpired that led up to the cross. And this week being Passion Week, of course we know that in just a few days we're going to be celebrating a wonderful event, and, and that is the resurrection of the Lord. But let's not forget about those things that transpired before the resurrection. Because in order to have a resurrection, you would have to have a death. And, and I want to remind you, as, as I read the verse of Scripture before worship, that said in John 3, 16, God really loved us. He loved this world so much that He sent the very best heaven had to offer, and that was His only begotten Son. And whoever would believe and put their faith and trust in Him would be saved. And that is, Jesus Christ is the only hope, my friend, of this world. In fact, there's no other name given under heaven by which men may be saved except the name of Jesus and in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. But during this week and, and right before we partake communion together, which is a very special thing to do, and I'm so glad that you, you joined us today and that you're getting ready, you're preparing your hearts. Hopefully the worship did that and we've directed our attention and our focus on the, on the suffering that Jesus went through even before the cross. If you could think about the beating and the, and the whipping, he took the stripes upon his back for our healing and uh, he was so abused, a crown of thorns on his head. In fact, before he was even nailed to the cross, he was beaten so bad that he was unrecognizable. If you can just think about uh, somebody beaten that bad that you couldn't recognize who that person was. Well, Jesus went through that, and he went through that for you and for me and for the whole world. And I hope and I pray that the Holy Spirit really brings this back to us in a real vivid way during this occasion. No wonder the Apostle Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 18, the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but to us that are saved, it is the power of God. In fact, in another place he said in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 2, For I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. So I just want you to think about what he went through, what our Savior and our Lord I want to remind you of some of these old hymns. It says, At the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light, and the burden of my soul rolled away. It was there by faith I received my sight, and now I'm happy all the day. I'm so thankful for the cross of Jesus Christ. Uh, that's why we say, So I'll cherish the old rugged cross till my trophies at last I lay down. Not the cross itself, but what the cross represents because of who it was that died on the old rugged cross. Many people had been crucified. In fact, while Jesus was being crucified, there was two thieves on either side of him. But it was that holy one in the middle, that, that Lamb of God, that spotless Lamb of God, who shed his precious blood that we might have forgiveness of sins and the promise of eternal life. As the course as he was wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities, Surely he has bore our sorrows, and by his stripes we are healed. So many great songs by so many great songwriters through the years. I just got to give you one more uh, that says, Oh, what a Savior! Hallelujah! His heart was broken on Calvary. 
His hands were nail scarred and his side was riven. He gave his life's blood for you and for me. That's why in Hebrews 12 and verse 2 it says that we look to Jesus, who is the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Before we take of the Lord's Supper today, I want to I read you a very graphic description of a crucifixion. This was written by Dr. Truman Davis. He was a medical doctor, and he sat down one day and, and he wrote out a physical description of what it must have been like, looked like, and felt like, what Jesus literally went through physically and emotionally while upon the cross. And as I read through this powerful, very uh, eye-opening revelation of what he went through, I want you to think about it, and I want you to take it seriously to heart because Jesus went to the cross for you, and he went to the cross for me. And he could have at any time, I believe, caught an angel, it wouldn't have took more than one, from heaven to come as as the song said that I sang right before we, we came back into the message, had it not been, thank God he didn't call angels from heaven to come. But he could have. He could have. But he prayed in the garden, Father, not my will, but thy will. That doesn't mean that the Lord wasn't willing because he went to the cross willingly. No, no man took his life. He freely laid it down for you and for me. So get ready because after I read this, very eye-opening description of the crucifixion. We're going to come back and we're going to take communion together. So prepare your hearts as we begin to read. This is a description that Dr. Truman Davis, a medical doctor, has given us concerning the crucifixion. The cross is placed on the ground. The exhausted man is quickly thrown backwards with his shoulders against the wood. Now remember, this is after everything he had already went through, after he carried his cross up to Galgotha's Hill. The legionnaire feels for the depression of the, at the front of the wrist. He drives a heavy square rod iron uh, through the wrist and deep into the wood. Quickly he moves to the other side and repeats the action. Being careful not to pull the arms too tightly, but to allow some flex of movement, the cross is then lifted into place and plunges into the hole with great force. The left foot is then pressed backward against the right foot and with both feet extended, toes down, a nail is driven through the arch of each, leaving the knees flexed. The victim is now crucified. As he slowly sags down with more weight on the nails in his wrist, excruciating, fiery pain shoots along the fingers and up the arms to explode in the brain. The nails in the wrist are putting pressure on the median nerves. As, as Jesus pushes himself upward to avoid stretching torment, he places the full weight on the nail through his feet. Again, he feels the searing agony of the nail tearing through the nerve between the bones of the feet. As the arms are fatigued, cramps sweep through the muscles, knotting them in deep, relentless, throbbing pain. If you've ever had a cramp, you know what I'm talking about. With these cramps comes the inability to push himself up to breathe. Air can be drawn into the lungs, but not exhaled. He fights to raise himself in order to get even one small breath. Finally, carbon dioxide begins to build up in the lungs and in the bloodstream, and the cramps partially subside. Spasmodically, he's able to push himself upward to exhale and bring in the life-giving oxygen. Hours of this limitless pain, cycles of twisting and joint-rending cramps, intermediate partial asphyxiation, searing pain as tissues torn from his lacerated back as he moves up and down, against that rough timber of the cross. Then another agony begins, a deep crushing pain within his chest as the pericardium slowly fills with the serum and begins to compress the heart. Well, it's now almost over. The loss of tissue fluids reached, has reached a critical level and the compressed heart is struggling to pump his heavy, thick, sluggish blood into the tissues and his tortured lungs are making a frantic attempt to grasp 
any small gulps of air, he now can feel the chilling hand of death creeping through his tissues. Finally, he can allow his body to die. Finally, he cries out, It is finished. And into the Father's hands, he commended his spirit. What a powerful, powerful, vivid picture of the crucifixion. When my wife and I went to Washington, D.C., we were privileged to walk down a lot of the, the, to the places where a lot of the memorials are for those that have given their life in World War I and II. And we, we walked down and saw the Victims Veterans Memorial and etched in black granite wall are the names of 58,156 Americans that died in that war. Since its opening in 1982, the Stark Monument, it stirred many deep emotions. Some visitors walk its length slowly, reverently, and without pause. Others stoop before certain names, remembering their son, uh, their sweetheart, or a, a fellow soldier, wiping away tears. Some of them will trace the names with their fingers as they honor the memory of the fallen soldier. Well, we come to you right now as we are about to partake of communion. We're looking to the cross because when we think about and we read about the scriptures and we think about the Lord's suffering and what he went through, the Lord says for as often as we do this, for as often as we take of this little cracker that represents his body, we drink of the juice that represents his blood, Jesus said, for as often as you take of this, you do it in remembrance of me. And we do remember him. This week especially, we are focused. We are laser focused upon the sacrifice of the precious Lamb of glory as he came to give his life on an old rugged cross that you and I might have life. And it more abundantly here, but more importantly, salvation of the soul that we can have eternal life through Jesus our Lord. So right there where you are, if you would take the bread, we're going to pray over it, we're going to bless it, and let's partake together. Father, we thank you for sending Jesus. We thank you for your love that you have for mankind. Though we did not deserve it, we deserved justice, but you sent us mercy. We deserved judgment, but you sent us your only begotten Son, and as we partake of this wafer today, representing his body, we do so with a grateful heart, with a thankful heart. We thank you, O Lord. And if you're watching right now and you don't know Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, what a special moment to just pause and just pray that prayer. Say, so Lord Jesus, I'm sorry that I'm a sinner. I know that you came and you died and you rose again, that you are God's only Son, and I commit my life to you and I confess my sins and I invite you into my life and I determine and I dedicate my heart to you right now that I'm going to live for you. And according to the scriptures, the Bible says if you've confessed with your mouth and believed in your heart, then you will be saved. What a special moment this would be as we partake of communion together. See, that's really the only requirement. Uh, partaking of the Lord's cup together. It's not belonging to one particular denomination. Uh, not one branch uh, of the church, but it's belonging to the family of God. And so let's partake of the bread together as we do it in remembrance of Him. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I'm reminded of the old chorus that says, Oh, how He loves you and me. Oh, how he loves you and me. He gave his life. What more could he give? Oh, how he loves you and oh, how he loves me. Oh, how he loves you and me. Let's take the cup that represents his shed blood. Not the blood of goats or calves. Not the blood of some animal. But his blood. Precious blood. Spotless blood. Holy blood that was shed on Calvary. And by His blood, we are cleansed and we are 
not only forgiven, but He washes us our sins away. And cast our sins as far as the east is from the west, never to be remembered anymore. Let's partake of the cup together. Thank you, Lord, for the blood. I'm so glad that you've had this opportunity, that we had this opportunity to take of the Lord's Supper together. I want to speak a blessing on you today. Father, I speak a blessing upon your people right where they are. Lord, I know that they are having to endure some things right now that they're not accustomed to, whether it be separated from their family, not being able to go and do some of the things they would enjoy doing. Sometimes, Lord, loneliness tries to creep in or oppression or depression. We go through a lot of things emotionally and psychologically. But I come against the attack of the enemy right now and I just speak blessings on your people that they'll be encouraged today. Lord, that our hope, we know our hope does not lie in man, but our hope is in you. You are the hope of the world and that's our theme for this week. And Lord, I just speak into your people right now encouragement and Holy Spirit I know that you're with them as much as you are with me right now and I pray your anointing to rest upon them meet their every need O oh Lord whatever they may have and I pray for divine protection against any attack of the enemy and I ask it in Jesus name Amen thank you for joining us uh, we look forward to seeing you very very soon God bless you